There was a friend come to visit yesterday. In the course of the conversation, a little story was told and the question was asked, what was the meaning of this story? And because this friend is of a very intellectual bent, there was an immediate objectifying of the elements of the story. And then it was said, but what about if we look at the story, recognizing that every element of the story is an aspect of our self or a part of our own psyche. And there was an observable shift and change in this friend as to the awareness of the story so that the answer that was given was totally subjective and very cogent and on the spot, knocker as you would uh, maybe crudely say. And it's wondered if we can relate this to that uh, much touted saying is uh, take all perceptions from the sensual, the ascetic and the transcendent levels of mind and bring them to the subtle level of body, speech and mind. So we can recognize from our own experience there's a distinct shift that can be made in ourselves when we consciously bring our mind from those differentiated levels of mind, sensual, ascetic and transcendent, and move it to the subtle level of mind. And we also recognize that this state of the subtle level of mind can be brought about by meditation. When we meditate, we know that our mind is lifted and brought to this level where uh, we can say we're in a state of satori or satchitananda. And the view from that state is totally different from that which we uh, perceive in those differentiated levels of mind. So we know that meditation, uh, just to use one of the things that can be used, are very effective in bringing us and being aware of the subtle level of mind and the differences there are between living in that uh, dual world or the objective world uh, and or living in a state of such it and under. So there's a process involved here that is observable. And there are ways that this can be brought about. And this is, if you'll excuse, there being a little technicality here. But let's go to the story and see where it takes us. This is an old story about a very great rabbi called Rabbi Pinhas. Now, Rabbi, rabbi Pinhas was known very well for his ability, his ability to discern. But Rabbi Pinhas had a dream. He dreamt that there was a dark cloud resting over a certain village, the far distant place from where he lived. And in the morning after he'd been to the synagogue and the usual rituals and prayers had been completed, Rabbi Pinhas chose three of his Hasidim, three of them, and said, we are going on a journey today. There is a task that has to be fulfilled. So they set out in their carriage, and the journey took them all day until they arrived at the edge of a village just as dusk was coming down. But to Rabbi Pinhas' discernment, he was able to see this dark cloud, which he perceived as evil, resting over an inn. None of the other Hasidim, the three who accompanied him, were able to see this, but it was clearly discernible to Rabbi Pinhas. So, they descended from their carriage and they went to the inn and when they entered the inn 
there was the innkeeper sitting with his head downcast in a very dejected state. And Rabbi Pinha said, um, do you have a room available or rooms available for the night? And the innkeeper with his head still down said, no. And Rabbi Pintas said, well, are the rooms all full? And the innkeeper said, no, they're all empty. But then the innkeeper looked up and he met the steady, steadfast gaze of Rabbi Pinhas. And as he did, the innkeeper became clearly aware of a sense of holiness and power that was present. And so he said, no, well, yes, yes, you can stay. And after this, Rabbi Pinha said, I observe that you are in a very great state of sadness. Will you tell me what it is? And the innkeeper said, well, tonight is the night when preparations are made for the circumcision of my seventh son and my previous six sons died on the eve of their circumcision. I do not know what evil has befallen myself and my wife. We are good people. And Rabbi Pinha said, go to bed and rest. Leave the matter with me. And he turned to his three companions and he said, you three will keep vigil beside the cradle of the child throughout the night and you must remain awake. If you fall asleep, the consequences will be dire. So Rabbi Pinhas went off to his chamber leaving his three Hasidim to stay at the head of the cradle. And Rabbi Pinhas said, if there is a disturbance through the night, take this sack, a sack which he had asked of the innkeeper, and hold it over the head of the cradle. And then he warned them, do not go to sleep. You must remain awake and alert. Now, the three Hasidim took the words of their rabbi very seriously, and they kept themselves awake by chanting prayers. But as the night progressed, suddenly, the candles in the room began to flicker. There was no wind outside, but the window was open and the dancing flames were quenched. The only light that remained in the room was the light of the fire that was burning in the hearth. But the flames of the fire began to spurt and sputter, and suddenly the fire went out. The three Hasidim were very afraid. They could feel a chill in the air, and suddenly there was a swishing, whooshing sound from the window and quickly they held up the sack that had been given to them and suddenly there was something present because they saw 
two green eyes approaching the cradle. They held the sack high over the head of the infant and suddenly the creature landed in the sack and as they were told to do they immediately tied the sack to great hissing sounds. <coughs> they immediately called the rabbi as they were instructed to do. And Rabbi Pinhas came in with his staff. They had never observed the rabbi in a state of such anger because the rabbi took his staff and beat the creature in the sack unmercifully to great hisses and roars of pain. Then Rabbi Pinhas instructed the three Hasidim to take the sack outside the door of the inn and let the creature free, which they did. And they saw bounding off in the moonlight a great black cat. In the morning the circumcision took place on the healthy infant and a great reception was held. But the innkeeper said, it's very strange because on each occasion when there has been a circumcision, I have invited the duke, the squire, of this place to attend, but each time a messenger had to be sent to cancel, so I cannot understand why he was not present at the celebration. But Rabbi Pinhas kept his silence, and he said, well, maybe the Duke is incapacitated, why don't you allow me to take some of the celebratory wine to him? So this is what happened. So when Rabbi Pin has arrived at the squire's great palatial residence and asked to be taken into the presence of the Duke, when he was escorted in to the chamber of the Duke, there was the Duke lying, bandaged, with his bruises clearly evident, a look of hate in his eyes focused on the rabbi. Don't believe that I don't know who and what it was that happened, said the Duke. And Rabbi Pin has said quietly, yes, and so am I aware of all that occurred. And the Duke said, well, don't think that you are going to go unscathed. My magic is more powerful than yours. I challenge you. So it was that Pin Rabbi Pinhas agreed to meet this duke, who was, a, of course, a sorcerer, in a battle of magic. And so a time was set. And soon word got out to everyone in the realm as to what was occurring. So a great crowd came to observe. And when Rabbi Pinhas faced off with the squire, who was very confident of his powers, 
duke sneered at the rabbi. And without any ado, he immediately conjured up a great furnace with fire blazing inside. But Rabbi Pinhas quietly took his staff and drew seven circles. He then stood inside the center of the circles quietly. And out of the flaming furnace came a great lion roaring covered in flames but as soon as the lion attempted to enter the first circle it was not able to do so and went up in a puff of smoke now the sorcerer duke was very surprised because a great amount of his power had been used up in the lion. But again out of the flaming furnace came a tiger. But again the tiger was not able to penetrate but the second circle before disappearing in smoke. Rabbi Pinhas stood quietly in the center and the Duke, now somewhat perplexed, drew all the remaining power that he could conjure and out of the furnace came a bevy of creatures of all kinds, griffins and hogs and tigers and lions and hyenas and some creatures that could only have emanated from the bowels of hell. And whilst some penetrated the circles, none could pass through to the third circle. They all disappeared in puffs of smoke. Now the sorcerer, having used all his powers and angry that he had met his defeat, attempted to conjure from the flames of the furnace what could remain from that force, but having to come close to the fire, he himself was drawn in to its flaming center and himself was rendered to a pile of ash. Strange phenomena that we find when after participating, one might say, in a process of meditation or even in the conscious process of bringing our mind from the sensual, the ascetic and the transcendent or the lower levels of mind to the undifferentiated sartorial, Satchitananda level of mind. The way we perceive 
and understand all things is changed. There's no need to analyze. All things come together into a state of integrated awareness which brings about the response that arises as is the physical process involved in perception. So viewing this story from that state and level of mind where its teaching, the symbols, the sacred numbers and the overriding theme, motive, character merge does it could it be that it brings with it the possibility that we can glean in every interaction that we have with life that inevitably hold perceptions of one kind or another that we are living the secret contained in every story if so we have to know what that secret is. What is it that allowed Rabbi Pinhas to stand in the middle of the circles fearlessly, doing nothing? What's the meaning of the threes and the sevens? How do they come together in us? Thank you.